Kelly Sipe. I think most of you know her, our Drums Alive instructor and repeat presenter. Um, today is a really great topic. I'm going to be talking about happiness, 10 ways to make us happy. So I expect all of you to be leaving here with big smiles on your faces. <laughs> uh, before I leave, I just wanted to um, point out our snacks today. I hope you're all enjoying the refreshments. They are all available at our breakfast cafe that we have here at the center every day, 8.30 to 10.30. No item over $2. So if you enjoy what you're having today, join us for breakfast some morning. Like that commercial plug there? All right, thanks, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> here you go. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I just want to make sure everybody can hear me out back. She's going to make some copies for you, so we'll have some more. Um, my name is Kelly, and I do teach the Drums Alive class here. If you're interested in joining, that's 1 o'clock on Tuesdays. Um, but we've come back a couple of times to do some of these workshops. The workshop today is... Uh, 10 Keys to Happier Living. Now, the, the whole workshop itself, today's workshop, we've condensed it down for a one-time event, right? one-time workshop. Any one of these, if we look at the 10 keys, any one of the 10 keys could be its own workshop. In fact, I've done this as a series, a 10-week series. We do one a week over time. So this is really just the broad strokes of what the keys are. But I encourage you to look into it a little bit further. There is a book, 10 Keys of Happiness. Um, and then there's this uh, website called Action for Happiness. And they give you online prompts to help you with calendars on things to focus on a daily day basis. So there's lots of different resources out there. Again, this is going to be the broad strokes about, being, uh, about the 10 Keys of Happiness as we go forward. Yeah? OK. So we're going to look at this, and it's through a scientific standpoint. These are proven ways of us to find happiness in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, these 10 factors have been proven over and studied over and over. This 10 Keys of Happiness is out of England, out of the UK, but a lot of the research is through Harvard, Penn State, Columbia, Oxford and all around the world they have different studies that are going on that support this so it is definitely evidence-based evidence-driven um, keys for happiness all right the great dream this is what we're going to be looking at today g-r-e-a-t-d-r-e-a-m two five-letter words each one of these focuses on a different aspect of happiness, and these are your 10 keys. The first um, top, uh, the first ones rather, focus on things outside of us, and then the dream focuses on things inside of us. So if we go through them all, we'll go through these one by one as we get into this, but if the top is about giving, that's doing for others, versus direction is having goals for yourself. So it's about being outward, and then about being inward from there. Okay, so happiness. I want you to think about, again, these, you should have these on your pages somewhere. And what does happiness mean? And this I want you to think about in terms of general happiness. What does happiness mean to you? And again, an example would be feeling good about how things are going. This isn't a specific event. This is just, if somebody asks you, are you happy? Yes or no? It kind of goes like that. For me, happiness is having my family and friends around me, having them healthy, having connections, these connections, purpose, all of these things lead to general happiness versus a specific event. So I want you to think about those in two different terms. The next one, did I spook? Yeah, I did, okay. This one is the specific things that make you happy. The specific things that make you happy are things that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis. Once you figure out what are the things that make you happy, it's something that you can do to repeat. Now, this changes over time. Something that makes you happy today may annoy you in <laughs> two years. You don't know. But for me, when before marriage, before kids, it was spending a Sunday morning with the big, giant Providence Journal newspaper and the Boston Globe curled up on a blanket watching either football or movies. 
not going anywhere, not doing anything. That was happy. Today, coffee. <laughs> I love my coffee, but I love disconnecting from everything. And I'm not talking about disconnecting from people, although sometimes I, I definitely want my cone of silence. I want people away from me. But most of the time, it's disconnecting from technology. Social media, emails, text messages, everything comes at us and is bombarding us 24-7. So for me right now, total happiness or being happy, very specific things are being completely disconnected from technology. I love snow days, right? You think of a snow day, everybody's home, everybody's safe, can't do anything. Love those days. Those are my favorite happy days. So we want to try to incorporate a lot of this into our day-to-day -day lives. Key one, giving, doing things for others. Caring for other people is just fundamental to who we are as humans. We love to care for others. Helping others not only helps them, but it helps us. And giving creates stronger connections, whether you're giving to family and friends or your community. It creates these strong connections that we want to maintain. And it's not all about money. You know, when we think about giving, some people think, well, you know, I give to charity, I donate money. It's not about that. Sometimes it's time. Giving your time somewhere, spending your time with somebody, teaching, teaching a skill, something that you've learned and passing it on to someone else. So it's definitely not all about money. If you want to feel good, do good. It's pretty much a primary um, source of happiness. Think about it as a ripple effect. And we think about if I do good to you, you'll then do good to somebody else. It's a contagious event that happens. And very often, and if we think about it, it I'll say it in terms of money. You're going through Dunkin' Donuts, you pay for the person behind you, completely unexpected, maybe they pay for the person behind them. Maybe they get a special gift and bring it back to the office or back to their house, whatever it may be, because of that ripple effect. It doesn't necessarily have to be money, but it's just a clear, easy example for us to understand that. So really, if you think about, if you want to feel good, do good. And then do kindness for others. This is where it really becomes more personal for you. Helping others definitely helps ourselves. We can sort of get out of our own way when we start focusing on other people. Studies have shown that doing kind things literally gives us a brain or boost. Now we talk about, especially if you're in my exercise classes, the endorphins from exercise. The same thing, that happiness um, gene, that happiness energy gives off, off when we start giving and helping others takes our minds off our own, water, our own worries. Very often we get into that spiral. Sometimes we can't stop thinking about what might be going on, and we need to distract us from that. It also connects us um, to others in an important way and with our well-being as, as well as theirs. Sometimes it's helping your neighbor. Maybe you mow their lawn or take their trash out because you know they're not feeling well, they're not doing well. One, you've made this connection to them. Two, they appreciate it more than you could possibly know, and that you helping them also makes you feel well as you're going through this. There's lots of different ways that we can help, help others, but it's important to think about maybe the people around us that are having difficult times. I know when I'm at my lowest, some of the best things I do is helping somebody else who is struggling as well gets me out of my own mindset, and helps me help them. I'm just reading, making sure. Yes, OK. Random acts of kindness. This is truly has become part of our community, a part of what we do. Has anybody had random acts of kindness? A couple of things, yeah? So again, that coffee. You know, you're going through and get coffee from somebody who paid for it. One time I had somebody pay for my toll. I have an easy pass, <laughs> so I was going through the really fast one, and it happened to be the easy pass, that fast lane was down, so we all had to go through the gentry, and he paid 
my toll behind me. I'm like, nice. You know, it's unexpected, these random acts. And it doesn't necessarily have to be monetary. It could be just anything in general randomly. Think about what you can do. We had a contest in one of my groups that we were doing this workshop with. For 30 days, we had to come up with 30 ways of passing on a random act of kindness. Let me tell you, when you get into day 15, it's really hard to start figuring out how you're going to do something randomly without repeating it. But it does challenge you a little bit, but it also was a lot of fun. It was fun for us. It was fun to hear how everybody else did and what they did with their random acts. So here's an, you know, some of these good ones, giving up your seat. It doesn't happen that often. But this would be a prime example. If somebody's coming in now, we only have a couple of seats left. Maybe we can move, give up your seat, you go find another seat, something like that. I use a walker. And those of you that always use walker or canes, somebody opens the door for you. I can't even begin to tell you how helpful and appreciative I am of something like that. Uh, making somebody laugh. If that's part of who you are and you want to make somebody chuckle, that's always a good way. Make somebody new feel welcome, especially in a place like this where you have new people coming all the time. Introduce yourself, talk to them, see where they're from, find out a little bit about them, make them feel that they are part of your community. Um, offer to help somebody with shopping. I know this is a big one. And again, I don't go shopping anymore, so it's a big one where I can just type in and have it the order pick up. But sometimes, People don't know how to use that technology. Maybe you're helping somebody figure out how to place their grocery order for pickup. Pass on a book you've enjoyed. About once a month, I'll send out a request to all my friends. What are you reading? What are you liking? And it's just a referral of things that people like to do, right? My husband, big history buff. So once a month, we find some good history books for him to get. My father-in-law, he's a pilot, or he was a pilot, so his is all about aviation. So we're always looking for these things and then we pass them on. And it's fun to pass on or connect people together. So if I know my father-in-law who's big on aviation, when I meet my next door neighbor's son who's learning to fly for the first time, I connected them by phone call, first by email, then by phone call, so they could chat with each other. That was a huge connection. They're generations apart. They never met each other but they were able to make a connection. Volunteer your time, paying somebody things in queue, saying you're sorry and giving forgiveness. That's internal. You know who you want to say sorry to, you know who you want to forgive. But that's internal. Sometimes you just have to make that decision to make the apology or to forgive. It'll be, less on, it'll be better for your mindset than it is for theirs, but you will feel better with doing that volunteering your time, visiting a sick neighbor or friend. COVID has really told us and taught us how fragile we can all be and what it really means when somebody goes down and goes down quickly. Sometimes it's just a phone call. How are you doing today? Right now I have uh, my friend's father is in hospice and she was on vacation when she got the phone call that he was being moved to hospice. Every two days I'm checking in. It's not anything serious. No big chat, I don't want to interrupt her, but you know what, I'm here, you want to go get a drink, you want to go get something to eat, you want me to go shopping for you. What do you need? Sometimes it's just something silly and little as that. So we want to try to find, as we do the giving, um, the G, is how can we bring these random acts of kindness into our everyday lives, right? How can we do it? Maybe challenge yourself to 30 days. What does that look like? Maybe it's once a week. Maybe let's not do 30 days. I'm telling you, that's kind of hard. Maybe it's once a week you do something random. Everything doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be grand gestures. Very often, we all think that it doesn't count unless it's a grand gesture. Do you remember Oprah? You get a car, and you get a car, and you get a car. I'm not giving out cars. But something small can really be helpful to other people does not have to be grand gestures in order for it to be important. Remember that even those small things, the smiles, the opening the doors, the introducing yourself to somebody new in your community really does make a difference for them and for you. So here, what have you done recently to make someone else happy? If you have your worksheets, this is where you can start writing things in. But you'll have these to take home with you. Whenever you're feeling a little overwhelmed, 
refer back to these worksheets because sometimes if you're feeling overwhelmed by focusing somewhere else, by giving, will help you with that. Not all acts of kindness, no matter how small, is ever wasted. Practicing the doing the small acts of kindness, random acts of kindness, and reach out to somebody who's struggling. Those are the hard ones, right? You may know somebody who's struggling. Maybe they're not even vocal about it. Maybe they're not sharing that information. Maybe you've heard it through the grapevine that they're either sick or their spouse is sick. Make the call. You know, don't think that you're interfering. They'll tell you. More, you know, if they don't want you to come over, they're going to tell you that. But do it so that you're still connecting with them. Let them know you're thinking of them, no matter what they're going through. All right. Any questions so far? None of you have questions ever. Okay, connecting with others. Relationships are a big deal. Relationships close with family and friends really do contribute to our overall happiness. People with strong, um, close connections with their family and friends, as well as their community, live longer. Okay, let me repeat that. Strong connections with family and friends and your community help you live longer. Um, the broader the networks that you have, those connections, the happier you're going to be. So we talked about connecting my father-in-law to my young neighbor who's flying. That's a connection outside the family, truly even outside their community, but they've made that connection. Think in your communities, what are you involved in? What are you doing? How can you make connections? There's garden clubs, there's library, book clubs, there's the COA. There's so many ways to connect in the community. Finding ways to be connected to your neighbors is a big deal. That's your broader community. So when we're together, everything is better. It's fun. <laughs> Someone's is going off. I have a new puppy at home. And it's beating me up like nobody's business. OK, so even this, the connections that we make, the close connections, are really big. And you do not have to be in the same room to have these connections. My in-laws live all over the world. Right now, they're all in Pennsylvania. Ohio, Michigan, and Maryland, my in-laws, my husband's family. We had them in Germany. They finally came home. We had some in Florida. They went back. So we're a little bit closer than what we were. But we still maintain those connections, right, with nieces and nephews. It's the phone calls. It's the cards. It's the get together once a year. Zoom. We've had COVID. Get on Zoom. See what's going on. We've missed a lot over the last couple of years, but does not mean we, can, we need to lose those connections with our families. Building the strong relationships. Feeling connected is really part of our happiness. It really gets down to ours and theirs. There's nothing worse than feeling like you're being excluded. Right? We talked about this last time with, when we talked about living with chronic illnesses. Sometimes if you say no enough, people will stop asking you to do stuff. And there's nothing worse than that feeling of that disconnection, that loss of connection with that person, with that part of your family. Try to maintain those connections. Find different ways to keep that relationship going. Um, connecting to our families, partners, friends, colleagues, contributed to connections, to our resilience, as well as our happiness. Having that connection builds up your resiliency, right? You want to be able to have people that you can depend on as part of this, but also have them depend on you. It's, it's back and forth feeling for us. So we want to make sure that we take actions to keep those connections. Again, we talked about not being included anymore. Well, how do you do that? How do you remedy something like that if you're living with an illness and you're no longer going to graduation parties, communions, weddings? Well, you figure out a different way. For me, it's having that specific family group come to my house for a barbecue outside. So instead of facing a family of 45 people in a restaurant, I have five outside in my backyard having a cookout, right? It's usually bring your own, right? We always have somebody, you know, bring whatever they want to eat, have enough for, you know, all of us, and we just hang out for a little bit that way. 
maintain those connections somehow, find the way to keep those connections going. So all of the relationships are challenging, but the relationships matter. If they matter, they're important, and you need to keep those connections. The easiest thing you can do is just contact somebody and say hello. Does it, it could be written, it could be email, it could be a phone call, a voicemail, a text. It does not take much. I have a, we call her a cousin of our family. We've just known our families have been connected for 70 years. We don't see her very often. She's on and off social media, so I don't actually see what happens with her. But probably once a month, I'll just go call her and say, hey, what's going on? And that's all it takes. Just to make sure, you know what, I'm thinking of you. I want you to know that. Give me a call when you can. And then keep those connections going. If they're important to you, then it matters. You really want to make sure they're there. Think about why you want to stay connected to them. Sometimes you admire something about them and that's something that you want to continue with. And again, I think of this, my cousin here that I say, she is a Harvard graduate, she's a nurse, she lives on her own, she's been divorced, and she did this all after the age of 40. Talk about keeping stuff going, right? I was so impressed with her that I admire that about her and I want that in my life. I want that ability or that person to influence what's going on in my life and around me. So what helps you stay close to those, that are, those people that are important to you? Is it phone calls? Is it dinners? Is it going out for holidays? Think about what that is that you need to stay close to the people that are important to you. Another thing that I want you to focus on is being present, giving somebody your attention. Right? You have somebody that you're connected to. You have somebody that you want to keep that connection. Sometimes you just call them and listen to what they have to say. Don't be distracted. Don't be in and out saying, okay, the dog is here. I got to go. I got to go. I'll call you back. Give them the 20 minutes that they need so that they can talk to you and sort of lighten their load a little bit. It's the easiest way that you can stay connected to somebody. All right. Any other questions? No, exercising, my favorite part. So those of you that know, I do the exercising, I do one of the exercising classes here. And exercising in general just connects your mind and body. It makes you feel good. It gives you those endorphins, dopamine, there's lots of chemicals that exercise does. Now, exercise does not need to mean you're gonna go run a marathon. In fact, it probably doesn't mean that at all. But staying active is a big deal. It improves your mind, it improves your, um, your physical well-being, and it can also pull you out of depression if you're ever in that spiral. So be active, relax, rest, repeat. It's kind of what the motto is, yeah? Unfortunately, humans, our lifestyle has changed so much over the years that we are not as active as we used to be or as we're meant to be. Things have changed, and we are sort of the victims of our success. We've, got in, we've, we've invented and built a society of leisure, right? We've, we've got chairs to sit on instead of squatting on the floor. We've got cars to drive instead of walking everywhere. So we are a victim of our success of living in a first world country. But that does not mean that our physical being, our physical well-being hasn't changed. We haven't changed or evolved that much. But we definitely want to make sure that we are staying active through all of that. So some of the things that you can think about, and it's not always pleasant, but moving. Just get up and move. Doesn't matter what it is. Housework, gardening, uh, going out to the mailbox, make it a little trip, whatever it needs to be. Keep yourself active and moving throughout your day. The CDC, the guidelines are 30 minutes a day, five days a week. So you have 150 minutes of exercise every week. This could be broken down into 10 minute segments. 
10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon, 10 minutes at night. You've reached your 30 minutes of exercise. That does not mean that you get to sit for the rest of it. But that's usually what we think of. We think of, okay, if I work and move a half an hour, then I get to sit and do nothing the rest of the day. That's not how it goes. You still need to be active throughout the rest of the day. Taking care of your body. There's lots of things that we can do with this, but moving and eating and sleeping. And I want you to think about all the things that your body needs. And we do this because we become accustomed. I keep talking about the story of throwing a frog in hot water. If you throw a frog in hot water, it's going to jump out. But if you put a frog in cold water and slowly inch the temperature up, slowly by slowly, hotter and hotter, it doesn't recognize it and it will boil. That's what happens to us. Nothing we do, and I'm not going to say nothing, but most of what happens to us is over a long time and it, we don't feel the changes in our body. It's not like we're going out and we have a car accident, all of a sudden I can't move and I can't walk. Yes, that happens. But for the majority of us, it's arthritis that has evolved for 30 years. It's backache, it's pain, it's muscle fatigue that has evolved for 30 or 40 years. These are things that we can actually control and maintain. Some of the things that we definitely get from exercise is an emotional boost, a physical boost, and a brain boost. All of these things with exercise makes you feel better. It, there's just no doubt about it. And I, I can't tell you enough for how much I want you to keep exercising. So what activities and healthy things do you enjoy? What is it that you enjoy to do? So now we're on exercise, we're on our third key. What things can you do every day that you enjoy doing? It's truly that simple. And we try to incorporate these things into our daily lives. Once you identify what it is, it's easy to repeat it. So again, try not to limit your sleeping and sitting for 23 and a half hours a day. That's a joke. Nobody should be doing that for 23 and a half hours a day. So another thing you want to think about is going outside. I know, like today was cold. Today was like the first rude awakening for the day, yes? For the season. And, it was, and I have a sweater. I haven't had one yet since probably March, April. So things are changing. And it was cold. Getting outside, getting in nature is a big, big deal. Sunlight, outside, touching the ground, being fresh air, all of this helps with our physical well-being as we get through it. Turn off the TV. Now, I don't know about your generation. My generation has the TV on 24-7. My grandma never had the TV on. She could sit in silence. That would make me insane. <laughs> but it depends on where you are. Turn off the TV. Get yourself moving. Create the hobbies in your house that you're not sitting so much. And find a distraction for you. Oops. Awareness. Living life mindfully. This is a big one. Anybody ever hear of mindful, mindfulness? Yes, a little bit. Learning to become aware of your situation. We call it being present in, the, in wherever you are. So we're gonna talk about how it helps you to keep in tune with your feelings, but it also helps you to focus on what is happening right now, right here. A lot of it comes down to leaving your problems at the door. Right, you walk in, we're here for this workshop. We have a hundred other things that are going on in our life. Leave them at the door. Come in here, focus on what's going on, paying attention to what I'm saying, paying attention to your neighbors, what's going on here. When we do our, our exercise classes, that's a big one, right? I've turned off my phones, I don't have any distractions. Every once in a while, I will have to say, you know what? Something's going on in my family. I could have an emergency call, and if I do, I apologize now, but I have to have the phone on. Most of the time, you don't see my phone. It's gone. I don't pay attention. I'll check it before I walk in, and I'll check it when I go out. Being present in that moment is a big deal. So there's more to life when you notice what's around you. Very often, we don't notice things. We sort of, how many people have been driving their car and you go right past your exit? I probably do it once a week. 
I travel to so many different places in so many different pl times that I go by the same exit over and over and over again that I forget that I have to get off that exit. That is, I'm, my, my mind is distracted, I'm doing the driving, I'm safe, but I'm not paying any attention to what I need to do. So we don't notice things sometimes that are going on around me. I also don't notice when people beep and wave at me. <laughs> they beep, I just wave. I have no idea if they're beeping at me or if they're beeping at somebody, and I have no idea who it was. Does not matter. So I am very, very bad at taking awareness of people, of things that are around me. So being mindful. This is a practice of, again, of being present. Whether you're listening to a song, ever hear a song and you wind up sitting in your car a little longer just to hear the end of the song? Watching a movie. Sometimes your favorite movie comes on and you're just gonna sit and watch the movie. These are things are you're being present, you're being mindful to what's going on. Taking time to notice your surroundings. Very often you can feel calmer just by getting, leaving it at the door, right? If you've got a hectic day going on and you know you're coming here or you're gonna to come to an exercise class or a, a crocheting class or whatever it is that you have going on here, leaving it at the door. You know you're gonna be able to spend 45 minutes not thinking about it not stressing over what might be going on. And then, of course, being in nature. You have this beautiful deck out here. This is phenomenal. If you could spend time out here, I, I would do this all the time. Now, do you have a, um, a train that goes by here? No, it's a walking trail. So one of my other locations has this beautiful deck right here, and the train is right on the other side. So if they blow it by listening to the train come by every other hour. But paying attention, being outside, spending time out there, paying attention to the nature, hearing the birds, hearing your breath. Sometimes it's just a matter of calming your mind, calming your body with breathing exercises. All right, let's keep going. So what is mindfulness? Again, it is about being present. Mindfulness and meditation are not necessarily the same thing. They, they sort of lap each other, but they're not the same thing. When we think about mindfulness, in fact, let's do it right now. We'll do a little bit of mindful stuff. First thing I want you to do is we're going to do a four count of breathing. Four count breath in and then exhale. And I want you in through your nose. Everybody inhale. And then exhale for a four count. And push it out. I want you to push the breath out. So you feel that little tickle, tickle in the back of your throat. So try it again. Inhale. And exhale. Now we're going to close our eyes and do the same activity. We're going to close your eyes. Inhale. And exhale. Now some of the things about being mindful is paying attention to what's going on in here. We heard some coughing. We can hear maybe the leaves rumbling. You can hear my paper moving paying attention to what is here. Sometimes it's the smells. Nothing better for me is when I set my coffee to go off at 5 a.m. and I'm not up yet and I can smell the coffee from upstairs. Best, best scent in the world for me. So it's understanding, being aware of what's going on around and feeling that. We have a new puppy, I was telling you. Nothing is better. He drives me crazy 23 hours a day. But that 24th hour, he curls up on my lap and he snuggles and he's the sweetest thing. For an hour, <laughs> he's the sweetest thing. But being aware and being and taking advantage of those times where you're feeling things that are around you, but that breathing. Think of it a four count in, four count out. Another thing you can do while you're being mindful is press your fingers together, your finger, your thumb to all of your fingers as you're breathing. You can count four, three, two, one, and then back. This distracts your mind. You've got your breath work, you've got your finger distraction. A lot of the stresses that you may feeling will start to melt away. Now, if anybody has ever had somebody or yourselves with attention deficit disorder, right? So I have my nephew, holy smokes, he was a horrible child. We struggled because he had ADHD. And to manage with ADHD, a lot of what we had to do is give his mind focus. So we would call them fidget tools. We would give him things to focus on on his fingers so that he could write his history questions. 
focus something over here, he could do his math. That's what we're doing. We're focusing our mind. We're giving our mind a distraction so that we can start to focus of what's going on in the room that we are aware of and really take an action with that mindfulness. It's a practice. It is not something that comes easy. It can be difficult. You could get that to-do list. If you're in there for too long, if you're doing 20 minutes of mindfulness breathing, the to-do list could be in your head, and that's okay. Just acknowledge it, and then you know, maybe listen to what else is going on. You know, But it has to take practice, but it's something that could be so beneficial if you really, really focus on it. So what do you notice? So you had your eyes closed, and you had the room going. What were you noticing? Just now, when we did that. It changes. Absolutely. So she said that her tension changed. Her, her posture changed just by the breath work. Did anybody else notice anything else while we were doing the breath work? Nothing? So I was doing breath work. I heard somebody sneeze. I noticed that. Right? You're hearing and you're present and what's going on in your room. That's what it changes. The posture changes, your breath changes, your blood pressure slows down, your pulse slows down. So things can really have a physical and mental benefit here. Okay, give yourself a bit of headspace. Twice a day, try to take five minutes to do some of the mindfulness. Notice and appreciate all the good things that are going on. Sometimes instead of the to-do list in your head, think about what you did today that was fantastic. Right? Today, this will be my fantastic. When I sit back today, it's going to be, I'm going to remember this. I'm going to remember what we talked about. I'm going to remember all of you where you're sitting. I have one of those memories where I see pictures, and I have very clear pictures. So I will remember that. That's something. You know when I do my mindfulness? When I'm taking a shower. Quiet my mind. I'm focusing. I'm doing my hair. I'm shaving. But my mind is focused on things that I'm doing. And it's a calming, calming day for me. All right, let's keep going. Trying out. Trying something else out. This is all about learning and continuing to learn throughout our lives. We think about this as kids learning in school, but it doesn't have to be formal. We can learn and grow all the time. And as we go on in age, as we get older, sometimes our processing slows down, but we still want to learn new things. And trying new things is the challenge, right? It's not always repeating what you already know, but taking the skill to a next level. That's what we're talking about for trying out. Find the time to lose yourself in what you love. So again, anybody have any big hobbies that they love? Anybody want to tell me about a hobby? Who's got hobbies? Nobody. You all do nothing. <laughs> what was it? Oh, she started playing pickleball. So what do you do when you're playing pickleball? You're not thinking about your grocery list, that's for sure, right? <laughs> right? So you're learning. Anybody else start anybody new lately? No. Wow, you guys are the most boring people. I like to cook. You like to cook. I have somebody else. Now, I am not your friend because I don't like food. <laughs> so <laughs> I have somebody else who likes to cook. She's this big. Little Italian, weighs next to nothing, but makes these massive meals for her family. And that she loves. And she loves trying new recipes. So that's something else that people are trying something new. She's got a skill. She knows how to cook. Her challenge is trying new recipes, trying new genre of food. So you can have something that you like to do. Just challenge it a little bit more to get into something further. So trying new things, it can boost, let's go back to this, it can boost your confidence for the sense of accomplishment. Pickleball, right, when you first start you have no idea what you're doing, left to right, no idea. But once you get there and you start doing, you start to get more confident in that skill. So it's always good to learn that boost from the confidence is what you're looking for. Go beyond your comfort zone. Again, my friend, maybe for you as well. You're cooking the same things all the time, trying something different. That's outside your comfort zone. Maybe it's a skill that you don't have. My daughter made a cream cheese, strawberry cream cheese cake last night. Yeah, it did not, it was not good. <laughs> so we, it was tasted okay. The texture was good, but the flavor wasn't there. 
So she's learning. It's going out of her comfort zone. Every day she's trying something different. And that's what we're looking to do. Not perfection, just different. Going above and beyond your comfort zone. Curiosity is also con is considered a part of being happiness and building into your daily lives. Being curiosity. You know that curiosity killed the cat? Well, it didn't kill us. We're the curious people. This is why we have our... Um, luxuries that we do. People are curious. They invented the chair, the wheelchair. They invented whatever. I have to tell you, this right here, if you've seen my walker, I have a little cup holder on my walker, and it's flexible. I started this probably 20 years ago, but when I had the walker, couldn't put my coffee or water anywhere. Drove me nuts. My daughter had a stroller when she was little. I had pockets and things all over the place to put everything. But this, as an adult, they're not, you're not supposed to drink anything, apparently. So this is from a bicycle. It goes on a bike that you could put a water strap on. It's soft, it's easy, it's pliable. I've only found it once. <laughs> this has been with me for 20 years because now they have them, they're hard top. You can't fold up your walker so much, they get in the way. This is, they say that, what is it? The necessity is the mother of invention. That's the curiosity. How can you solve a problem? doesn't have to be major. This isn't major, but for me, this was major. This is a big deal. Finding things. Be curious about what's going on in your life. We had birds. <laughs> we had birds in my belfry, right? Isn't that how it goes? We had birds in my garage. Could not get rid of them. And they kept saying, we called the, the Audubon people. No, you have to wait for them to leave the nest. They had their babies. I called my husband's uncle, who lived in those sticks in Pennsylvania. And he said, get a glow, uh, strobe light, one of the disco ball strobe lights, put it on there. It annoyed them so much they left. Wow. Right? So it's one of these things. Who would have thought something as silly as putting a strobe light for birds would get them out? Curiosity, finding ways to make this, find a solution to what's going on. Keep learning. So what have you learned and you tried out? We talked about pickleball. Anybody else trying anything new? You said you liked your cooking. What else? Anybody else have trying something new? Yoga. Yoga. Big one. Big one. How are you doing with it? Take up low. So she had a conflict with it now, but she's thinking about going back. Anybody else trying anything new? Say that again. Art. Art classes. That's a big one. I find a lot of people I know taking up art. I do drumming, you know, one o'clock <laughs> Tuesdays, you can come and try my drumming class. But there's lots of things that you can do. And there's di trying different things for different parts. Maybe it is cooking. Maybe it's cleaning. Maybe it's finding a solution for your house and whatever it might be. Sometimes, so I have a hard time carrying laundry. So you have my, my laundry's in the basement and I had laundry baskets. And I would step by step by step going down. I throw them in a laundry bag and I throw them. That's my solution. I found the solution to make it work. I throw the laundry down the bottom of the stairs to the point where I've broken two railings. And my husband's like, stop throwing the laundry. Well, you have a solution. You could do the laundry. So that's our solution. Either I do it this way because it's the only way I can do it, or he can do the laundry, or he can fix the railings. And that's what we've been doing. We've gone through two so far. Find the solutions that work for you. Being curious and keep learning. Do something for the first time today. What could that possibly be? What have you wanted to do that you haven't done? Sometimes it doesn't have to be big. Sometimes it's finding an app on your phone. Maybe you don't even know what an app is and you want to do something like that. Maybe it's making an email. Sometimes it's something little that could have huge impact on your life. This huge impact on my life. Try something new, find something new. Learn a new skill, no matter what that skill is. My daughter's learning cooking, and she's learning trial by fire, basically. No recipes, she's just trying it out, and we're going. And we are eating all the food, and we're cleaning it up. That's the big problem. She, she trashes the whole kitchen, and we have to put all the stuff back together again. But figuring out things that you can do, try something new. Direction. Now we're getting into the second part. So these are all things that you could do out 
inter externally. So let's talk a little bit more about stuff that goes for your internal well-being and happiness. So direction. Direction is really about finding goals. And it's a big, big deal for your overall happiness. Anybody do New Year's resolution? Nobody does a New Year's resolution. No, a couple of you. A couple of you, right? So we all know what happens, right? We make the resolution on the 31st. By February 1st, it's long gone, and we've forgotten what it was. But that's a goal. We've created the goal, and that was what we wanted to do. That was our plan in our head on New Year's Eve, and we just failed to implement it. So what we do with goals, finding the direction, it motivates us to move forward. And that's a big deal, finding that motivation to move forward. It gives you something to look forward to. Right, some parts of creating goals is, is finding the path. I used to call it reverse engineering. I still call it that, but you have a goal way out in yonder. How do you get there? Well, you reverse engineer. You figure out all the steps that it takes for you to get there, and that's how you implement that change. So it's a lot about doing that, and it connects your present today to your future. Some people like to think about how it would feel to reach that goal. I want to lose 40 pounds. I've never lost 40 pounds. I don't know what it feels like, and I don't think it's ever going to come. So not only do you have to have a goal, but it has to be realistic and achievable. It can't be, I want to run a marathon if you've never run down the street, right? So it can't be these types of goals. It has to be achievable, has to be reasonable for you, and it has to be something that you want. You want for yourself, not for somebody else. Your doctor says you need to lose 30 pounds. Unless you buy into that, it's never going to happen. You need to do it for yourself, and that's when you can achieve those goals. Having a goal to look forward to. This is really what it's about. It's about connecting, again, your present to the future. You want to get excited and motivated about something. Again, it doesn't have to be big. How do you feel about the future when it happens? Have you thought about it? What is it going to change your life? Is it life changing or is it really something small? Giving you a sense of direction and optimism. And it gives you an outlook more than what it is today. So our per personal circumstances can actually dictate how we feel about the future. You know, sometimes we get into a little tailspin. We get into what we would call a pity party or the woe is me. We can't function beyond our present. And sometimes that's necessary, right? We, sometimes we're going through a trauma or sadness or an illness, and we need that time to get through it. But then there has to be a switch. You have to change your mindset. I have to look forward to getting up the next day. And how am I going to do that? Well, you have to make those goals. For a long time when I was very, very sick, the goal was to take a shower every day. That was it. It was a simple, simple goal. Find the goals that get you up into that direction of where you want to be. It does not have to be big. So what is the most important goals that you may have? Is it six months? Is it six weeks? I have to tell you one of the things that I do is I have a goal is I have to have a party at my house every six weeks. Yeah, you know why? So I clean my house. <laughs> I know that if I have people coming over to my house for dinner, I have a goal, six weeks. I have a list of things that I have to do to get done before that comes, and then I crash for three days after. This is how it goes. This is how it always goes. So having a goal, sometimes it's as silly as that. It doesn't mean to be big. It just has to be important to you for whatever those reasons are. Wise person knows which goals are ultimately fulfilling and which ones are illusions of fulfillment. The illusions are when you're doing a goal for somebody else. Fulfilling is stuff that's good for you, stuff that you want to do. Take the first steps. Think of a goal you're aiming for. Get started. Make the call. Sign up for the class. Whatever it may be, you have to take the steps. 
and then share your dreams. It's easy to tell three people. Once you have an accountability of that, that's why I, I send out, I don't send out, I call people. We're going to have Thanksgiving at my house. That's 21 people coming to my house. I have a five-year-old, an infant, and three puppies. 21 people coming to my house between now and Thanksgiving I have to get ready for. Already made the call. It's already planned. That's what we're doing. Make the call. Set it in stone. Set the action. Get moving on your goals. Resilience. There was a study that was done a little while ago, and it talked about what, how kids are resilient in school. What is it that makes somebody resilient? And this was through elementary school, middle school, and high school. What made them resilient? Does it depend, then they could all be in the same school with the same background, the same neighborhoods, very similar lifestyle. Why did some succeed? Why did some not? And it was the resiliency. It was sort of the grit. You know, that I'm just going to get through it. I know it's, got to, I know it's going to be bad. I'm just going to get through it. It's that grit. It's the resiliency that we, not, that we want. And we all have had loss. We've had stresses in our lives, trauma. It doesn't take away from all that. But it's acknowledging it and then figuring out a way to work through it. If you can't change, then you have to change the way you think about it, right? Can't change what happens. Sometimes we just have to flip the script, so to speak. How do we look at it? How do we change the way we feel about it? The way we think about it has huge impacts on how we respond, right? If we think that something is devastating, no matter how much we do, it will always be devastating. If you think of it, you had an event that happened to you. Yeah, that was horrible. But if you figure out a way to move forward, you're going to go forward. Uh, the way we respond, the way we think about it is really what's going to dictate how we move forward. Oops. So resilient thinking. It's one of these things called active coping. It's acknowledges that the difficulties are there, but finding something constructive to move forward with. So many of you know, and, and some of you may not, is that I got very sick when my daughter was eight months old. Very, very sick. Hospitalized, missed a lot of her at that time. How do you cope with that? I came home, I couldn't lift her, I couldn't walk, I couldn't do anything. But my coping skills, my active coping, was every day I did something with her to make her life better. Right? I have an eight-month-old at home. She needed to be fed. She needed to be changed. She needed to be played with and talked to and bathed and all of those things that go along with it. So my goal was each day was figuring out how to work with her, taking my illness and the depression that it was with and focusing somewhere else in order to help with the coping skills. It's essential that we do that. It's essential that we not only acknowledge what's happened, but figure out a way to move forward and through it. Coping isn't about ignoring it. It's just taking actions despite it. So again, bed bound, couldn't function. I had in-laws living with me, trying to take care of my daughter. Little steps is what made it go. I knew they couldn't stay forever. I still had to figure out how to do it. How did my husband was working? There was going to be a point where I was going to be with her by myself. Well, how am I going to do that? I no longer thought about what was going on with me. I thought about how am I going to fix this? How am I going to get her through every single day? It's not just, it's not ignoring what's happening, but it's figuring out how to continue to move forward. So what has helped you to bounce back? What gave you the grit? Anybody have any? Recent ideas? Yeah, nobody? So think about sometimes. I uh, listen to the music that I absolutely love. So she had said that listening to music helps her get through some of the bad times. I listen to music all the time. One of my favorite things to do. And in fact, whenever you're going to go somewhere to the doctor, to your in-laws, <laughs> to wherever you're going, 
listen to your favorite music and blast it. You could sing it in the car and have fun. We call it power movement, right? You listen to your music and it just changes if that's what you like to do. Other people could be meditation. It could be writing. A lot of people will write in a journal. So these things help. There's lots of different coping skills that we all use. So just a, an inspiration. Every day can be taken from a man for one thing. The last of human freedoms, the choice, one's attitude in a given environment. You can choose how to change. You can choose to fight. You can choose to wallow. You can choose to spiral. Lots of things. Happiness is a choice. It is not an easy choice. It is also not one that can happen simultaneously. You've lost a loved one. You need time to grieve. But there comes a point where you need to move forward. You get hurt. You need time to adjust. Then you move forward. It's not that you can choose to be happy at your worst moment. It's not putting rose-colored glasses on, right? We used to tell you that to my grandma. She sees the world with the rose-colored glasses. Well, that's her outward appearance to us. We didn't know that she was crying every night because that's how she coped. But we need to acknowledge these things and keep moving forward. Asking for help, confide in a friend. Nothing better than finding support with people that you know. Especially if you're going through something chronic, something traumatic, ask for help. People don't know how to help you. You need to tell them. Again, my friend's father is going in and out of hospice. I don't know what she needs from me. I don't know if, it, if I can make her a meal, if that was, or if I could pay for her to go to stop and shop. I have no idea what she needs from me. You need to vocalize what you need at that moment that you can ask for help. And when something is trouble you, troubling you, do something you enjoy. We had heard from her, something bothers her, she puts on music that she loves. Anybody else? When I was young, I was a lifeguard, and when things bothered me, I would jump in a pool and do laps. There's no music, there was nobody talking to me, it was in my head, by myself, physically active, moving my body, and getting to the point where I felt tired, physically tired, as opposed to emotionally tired. You we know the difference, right? When you're weary emotionally versus physically. Sometimes you need to catch up. Sometimes your physical being has to catch up to how you're feeling emotionally. And if that means that you have to go, did you have a question? A comment? Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. And it's a fantastic, so she was saying that she likes to walk when she's feeling bad, but she also walks with her head up, right? So what is that? That's posture, that's confidence, that's taken on the world versus your head down. This is a very secure position, but you're also very scared. That's a scared position. When you're looking down, you're looking at to see what you're going to stumble on. Now, I use a walker, I look down all the time, and I can't tell you that how many times I've stumbled, even though I could see it coming at me. It's, a, it's an insecure position. So she was saying that she likes to walk with her head up, and she notices what's going on around her. What did we talk about before? Awareness, mindfulness. She's hearing the leaves, she's seeing the leaves, the color changes. She's aware and she's present about what she's doing at that moment, and her, her fears or her illnesses or her stresses take a back seat, right? So that's really what we're trying to focus on. Emotions, look for the good. Not always possible, but it's helpful. Positive emotions like joy and gratitude and contentment not only give you um, relief in that moment, but it can carry you for days. Look for the good. There is good, what do they say? Not every day is good, but there is good in every day. Look for the good, and it helps. It truly helps when you can change your mind flip, mindset, flip the script in your head, and find what is going good for you at that moment. It's not always easy, but it's definitely helpful. 
see as life as it is, but focus on the good parts. We can train our brain, right? So this is, again, is choices to be happy. It's not easy. You know, we all go through trauma. We all go through sadness. We all go through times where we're just not able to rally, but we can choose to look for something good, right? My dog, my puppy for 23 hours a day is irritating me to no end, but that one hour, he's the cutest puppy ever. And that one hour, I would probably go get another puppy. That 23 hours, I don't want anything to do with any other dog, but focus on the good for what's going on. It's a big deal, it's hard to do. And think about the brain training when you do this. This is not easy, you can learn to do this. We as humans, we evolve to expect the worst. And we think about the worst, so that's a saying, expect the worst, prepare for the best. We focus on the worst. It's a fight or flight response that we have. If there's something bad going on, we will focus on it. But what we need to focus on is the good that's coming through it as well. It's not always easy. The pleasant emotions, uh, they're more than just feeling. They can change in your actions and attitudes. So taking the walk changes how she feels. The stresses are lowered and her positive feelings are increased. Unpleasant emotions, especially fear, it is usually fear for survival, right? We usually have this fight or flight, whatever it might feel like. We can avoid danger, but when it's triggered, we need to, to combat that with pleasant feelings as well. It's one of these things where, yes, have you ever been somewhere, and women will probably feel this more than men, is somebody's watching me. Somebody's around that corner. I don't feel safe, right? You get goosebumps, things in the back of your head are going up. I don't feel safe. You need to respond to that. That's that fight or flight. But when you get into the car, you lock the doors, you think, oh my gosh, <laughs> it was nothing, right? You need to come through with that. You need to relax. I have, my niece does not like dogs. She was little and she came up to see us a couple years ago. And my dog is, a, my older dog is a herding dog. It's a, an Australian shepherd. And what happens though is the dog herds the kids. The kids move, the dog's trying to get the, do the kids rallied around. So she's fast, she's five, she's running around like a crazy five-year-old. The dog is chasing her all over the place. The more she screams, the faster she goes, the faster the dog is chasing her. So this became this cycle. She was terrified after day one. So I needed to get that fight or flight out of her. So we spent the whole night up with the dog when the dog was calm sleeping, we, she was petting him, she was feeding him. Day two, she learned how to not panic. Day three, she loves the dog. We had to get that out of her because we all have that, but we have to recognize it. Sometimes it's not real. Sometimes it's just an emotion. Sometimes it's our experiences from the past that are coming up to haunt us now. Yeah, they really are. Handful though. So, what are good things that's happened in your life recently? Has anybody had anything extremely good happen recently? That's absolutely. So she's she's found spirituality, and that's one of these things. So if whether you're religious or not, if you think of spirituality as mindfulness, meditation, it all can be the same. No matter how you look at it, no matter what you're thinking of, it's a, a, a bigger being, a higher being that you're thinking of. That's what we can use to help. And she grabbed it to help on. Right now through COVID, we've all experienced a lot of different emotions. Yeah, these last two years have really gone up and down. We've learning to how to cope through different things that many of us have never faced before. So do what you know will feel good, right? What are your good to, your go-to things? Mine are really snuggling up, turning off the TV, turning off the technology and having a cup of coffee. That makes me feel good no matter what day it is. Find those things that make you feel good, that help you feel good on a day-to-day -day basis. And try to smile and say something good to someone else. 
Have you ever been somewhere and somebody says, I love your shoes? You know what? That's fantastic. Oh, love what you did with your hair. Did you get a haircut? Those things are great. Love that. Love, love, love that. Little comments like that. Not only do you say that to someone else and you make them feel good, but you feel good interacting because now you've had a positive interaction with someone else. Acceptance, being comfortable with who you are. So we talk about, there's that saying, accept yourself, warts and all. It's kind of what it is, right? Understanding what we have, what we are. Nobody's perfect. We don't expect ourselves to be perfect. We don't expect other people to be perfect. Don't expect ourselves to be perfect. And I want you to give grace to yourselves the way you give grace to others. If somebody was in a similar situation, would you yell at them? Or the way you yell at yourself? Our self-talk is so bad. Many of us are so hard on ourselves that we can't get out of our own way. And that self-talk is really what's going to keep us in a trapped downward spiral. Change the way you talk about yourself or talk to yourself. Don't compare what's going on with your insides to somebody else's outsides. So meaning, okay, I'm up here and I'm doing classes and I'm doing classes here once a week. Well, down the street, somebody else got in and they're doing classes, the same class, three times a week. Well, how did that happen? How did they get a class over there and I couldn't get it? And when I'm over here, I don't know. Maybe she knows them. Maybe she's been there for five years and they just started getting up. Comparing how I feel inside to what happened outside to that other person does not matter. It does not change anything. We don't know what that person has gone through or how they made that happen. Does not matter. Try not to make that comparison. Social media is a killer for this. People only post fun things on social media. They're not telling you all the bad stuff that they're going through. So you're watching this and you're thinking, gosh, they've got it all together and I have nothing going on. I don't know how they're doing it. Don't pay attention to it. Everybody's only posting their big moments. They're not posting the struggles to get there. Stop comparing yourself to someone else. Again, no one is perfect. And if you ever told yourself, if you ever told your friend, you know, don't be so hard on yourself. You know, take it easy. You've done well. You've gotten this far. Say it to yourself. Don't have unexpected, um, I don't even want to say this. How, don't expect so much more from yourself than you do from someone else, right? We want to be equal with them. Try not to beat yourself up. How we, have, how we see ourselves and feel about ourselves apply, it can directly influence our happiness. Our self-talk can knock us down or it can build us up. Acceptance versus esteem. esteem. Self-acceptance is accepting warts and all. I understand that all my limitations are. I understand where I am today. Self-esteem is you've got a skill that you've done very well at. People admire what you've done. So you are proud of that moment, that skill set. You've done very well at work. People admire what you do at work. That's your self-esteem. Self-acceptance. Yeah, I may be doing it well at work, but my house is trash and then nobody can come over to my house. So you have to accept both and you have to understand the differences, right? Cultivating a kinder, more constructive inner voice. That's that self-talk. We don't want to have our talk beating us up every day. The more you self-talk, the more you internalize it, the worse it's going to be. You, if you wouldn't say this to somebody else, stop saying it to yourself. Sometimes you need tough love. I get it. Get up and get dressed. Get up and take a shower. Whatever it may be, you do need that. But you cannot always just beat yourself up because you weren't perfect at it, especially if you're trying something new. Give yourself the grace to fail at something or to get better at it. Then it's finding out what your greatest strengths are. Again, accepting ourselves for who we are. What are your greatest strengths? What are your hidden talents? If you know what those are, then you can capitalize on them. You mentioned that you like cooking. Well, if somebody likes cooking, the best thing you can do is cook a piece of cake or a pound cake or dinner for someone else. That's your skill. That's something that you may enjoy doing. Me, I love coming and doing workshops. I love teaching exercise classes. I love 
getting people more active. This is something I'm good at, and I will capitalize on this. What is your skills? What do you like to do? How do you like to do this? And how do you like to bring other people along with you? You could ask friends, family. Sometimes family is not so much the best people to ask. If I asked my sister what I would do, she would not know what to say. So sometimes family is not necessarily the best people. And then be as kind to yourself as you are to others. Do not expect more from yourself than you would from anybody else. It's hard. It's really hard to focus on that. And then meaning. Being part of something bigger. Can you uh, just back up a bit and uh, review the self-acceptance and the self-being? Sure. So self-acceptance, let's go back. Yep, self-acceptance is accepting who you truly are, knowing who you are, flaws and all, right? Accepting that I can do a lot, but I have limitations because I have a walker. I can do a lot, but I can't do this. Self-acceptance. Self-esteem is when you have pride in what you do that you excel at. So think about if you were at work or if you're at home. Some people keep a beautiful yard. Beautiful yard. That's self-esteem. You take pride in that job. You take pride in what other people see. People will say to you, what a gorgeous yard. I wish I could do that, right? That's a skill that you have um, honed and that you're really, really good at. That's your self-esteem. It's almost pride, but it's still good. You still have it and you should have it. We want to excel in something and some things we don't excel at, but esteem is what we do excel in. We feel good about what we do. Self-acceptance is understanding that we can't be good at everything. That clear it up a little bit? Good. Okay, meaning, being part of something else, something bigger. Again, this is all about being part of your community, finding a bigger cause, something that's bigger than you. When kids are little, they think about their school, their neighborhood is the whole big world. And some people never travel. Some people will only see their neighborhood or their town as the whole world. They have no other experiences. When you realize that there's a much bigger world out there, things that they can do that are outside of their little neighborhood, then they start to really grow. And it's something that kids do, we as adults forget, but we should also do that. But being part of something bigger, right? So for me, the first thing that I became part of once I started feeling better was the um, New England Donor Services. I volunteer with New England Donor Services and I talk to people about becoming um, an organ donor, I talk to people about being on a transplant list, going through a transplant, and being on dialysis. So this was one of those things. This was me becoming part of the bigger community, having meaning in my life. That means a lot to me. I mean, it truly does. There's, I wouldn't be here today if I didn't have my transplant, if I didn't have dialysis. So having meaning in your life. My meaning now is this, is going out teaching people how to move more, exercising more, being part of communities, being connections here with all of you. That is meaningful with me. That's purposeful for me. So what can you do? How can you connect? The meaning of life, right? There's a, isn't that the biggest age-old question? What is the meaning of life? And again, it really comes down to having a life of meaning. And there's a story about a woman who all she did was take care of her family. She had six kids. Those six kids had four kids each. She was grandma, great grandma, aunt, all the way through. And she, yet when she passed away, was revered by her family, her friends, because everything she did helped them to become who they were. Doctors, lawyers, teachers, paramedics. If you think about your life as being small, maybe it is, but you're still impactful. You still have meaning. And finding that meaning, finding that purpose is truly what it comes down to. In my family, I have one side that's Irish, and I can't tell you, we have firemen, we have nuns, we have bartenders, 
we have paramedics, but we are very much um, service people. We can serve our community in many aspects. My mother's side is Portuguese, and they like to eat. <laughs> they, they have these great meals, and they cook, and they take care of the home. This is what we have these two different types of families, yet they come together, and we all have meaning in our own lives doing many different things. So finding meaning is really about what it is, the sense of being connected to your greater community. What happiness means to them, their initial start, their initial description is pleasures, bringing joy to others. As soon as your thoughts go from your internal happiness, what do you go from there? Your children, usually, spouses, family. These are all things that we want to pass on. That's all where we go. So family, pets, work, volunteering, hobbies, faith, nature that give our life meaning. Some people create hobbies based on um, their nature walks, right? They've, they've joined garden clubs. They've become part of the Audubon Society. They've created a bigger world, a bigger purpose based on something that they love to do. And then again, my father-in-law was a flyer. He flew in the Navy, and now he was flying on his own. He's 92 years old. He stopped flying about two years, right, right before COVID. And now he's not instructing them, but he's there as guidance for the younger generation coming on because he loves to talk about flying. Don't ever get caught talking to my father-in-law at a wedding because he will talk to you about flying for hours. So these are things that he loved to do and now he's finding purpose with it by helping others. So how does it lead to a more fulfilling life? Experts describe meaning as having three elements, coherence, mattering, and purpose. So coherence, let me get those, so I wanna make sure I get these right for you. I'm one step off, okay. Coherence is the feeling that you can make a sense of your life and how it fits into the world. Coherence is how you belong to the bigger world around you. Mattering, feeling that what you do has inherent value. And purpose, the sense of direction in your life. So these three things are what experts say lead to purposeful life or meaning of life. So they all make sense, right? How do you fit into the world around you? Knowing that you have value and knowing that you have purpose, right? So think about those things as we go on. There's no single prescription on how to make this work. This is really inherent to you, your goals, your lifestyle, your experiences. But we all can find ways that we can have any of these 10 keys, right? So if we think about going back to the keys, we started with the great dream. All of these lead us to different aspects of our lives, things that we can do outwardly, things that we can do inwardly. And I'm never ever going to say to you that you should do all 10 of them all at once every single day. Find one. Find one and focus on one. You have your, your information here. Pick one. Say, okay, this week I'm gonna talk about giving. What can I do? What, can, what random acts of kindness can I do? Maybe it's, maybe it's not even random acts of kindness. Maybe you call your neighbor and say, I'm going shopping, do you want me to pick you anything up? Reach out. Each week, try to focus a little differently on another aspect of this. The more you take into these 10 items into your daily lives, the more you're gonna to start to feel the meaning, the purpose, the happiness that you can get just by creating these habits, yeah? All right, does anybody have any questions for me? I, want, I didn't want to go too long. Anybody have any questions or comments about this? No, okay, so again, this is based on Action for Happiness. That's the name of the, um, the program that we go forward for, and there's a book 10 keys of happiness. These are not mine. I was an instructor for them right before COVID hit and then COVID they went online. So this was something that we did pre COVID. Um, they're out of England, but it's, it's still available and it's still relevant. But if you have any questions for me, please don't hesitate to reach out. Action for happiness. Go ahead. 
Oh, mine? Yep, I can leave you my cards up here, but my name is Kelly Sipe. My contact is K Sipe, S I P E, at B Y L, Beyond Your Limits, Inc. I know, fitandrec.org. And I'll leave my contact information here for you if you have any questions for me. Are we all good? Action for happiness. Yes, action for happiness is where we get this information from. And 10 Keys of Happier Living is the name of the book. Yeah? Anybody else? Any other questions? Thank you, thank you. Okay, everybody, have a great rest of the day. Enjoy your time.